In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of Bayesian state space models. Uh, and as a reminder, a state space model is one where we uh, separate the observations uh, in a time series from the, the latent state that describes the, the time evolution of the process. So we have a, a data model that represents the connection between the observed data and the latent state, in this case, a y, t being the observed data, and x, t being the latent state at that particular time, t, depends on some data model, g, with parameters. Um, and then we have a, a latent process model. That latent process model is a dynamic model, such that the state of the system now is a function of the state of the system in the past, uh, either the immediate past or, or multiple labs. And in, in doing so, we have to account for both the process error and the process model and the observation error and the data model. In previous lectures, we walked through a simple example of a, a random walk state space model and could show uh, you know, some of the strengths of this framework and its ability to deal with uh, missing data and its ability to deal with multiple, potentially with multiple data sources and partitioning uncertainties into process and observation errors. And, and that it moves seamlessly from uh, a calibration period into a, a forecast period. Uh, as a reminder, this is uh, the graph of the state space model, uh, again, showing how this latent state X is informed by three parts, the previous state of the system and the dynamic model that predicts the current state, uh, the future state of the system, which is constrained because of the dynamic connection through the dynamic model between the current state and the next state, and the observations at that point in time. And again, this, this figure shows uh, an example of both how um, the state space model follow, handles gaps in the data and it handles uh, prediction. And today I'd like to dive more into something that we talked about at the end of the last lectures, which is the generality of the state space framework. The fact that neither uh, the observation error or the process error need to be normal. They don't need to be the same type of data. They don't have to be the same temporal scale. Uh, we can handle gaps in irregularly spaced data and multiple data sources and time integrated observations. Uh, in the first part of this lecture, I want to particularly focus on uh, the handling of irregularly spaced uh, data, um, as well as the kind of the non uh, you know, handling differences in data models. So let's start with looking at a model uh, where we have reason to believe uh, that observation errors are different for different years, uh, either because methodologies changes, change through time or sample sizes change through time, or we are working with a data product that has a specific kind of QAQC error estimate. We can feed that in on an observation by the observation basis. So um, you know, previously, uh, we would typically assume a, a prior on the observation error uh, tau, which did not have a subscript t. It was just you know, one single overall tau. But now we have a tau that is specific to that time point. Uh, we have uh, priors that are now specific to that time point. And then we have uh, the data that enter in. And, and if we only are observing one point in time, we have an n of 1. Uh, in one observation, so one single squared error between the observed data um, and, and the latent state. So with only one observation, most of the inference we can make about this uh, observation error is coming from the prior. So it's really important if you're modeling unequal observation errors that you have some uh, informative uh, priors on uh, the, the parameters in this framework uh, that could come either from, like I said, feeding these in individually or potentially being able to deal with uh, different groups of data. So maybe the methodology changed over different times. So certain years uh, would be shared, uh, would have shared parameters. And you could also imagine doing something like this in a, in a uh, hierarchical framework where you know, there's shared variability uh, across years. Okay, so next I want to move on to, as I mentioned, this uh, idea of unequal sample intervals. Um, there's kind of two 
options for how to deal with unequal sample intervals in the state space model. Uh, one is uh, purely on the data side to treat the data as missing. So you set up um, your process model at kind of a, a default kind of constant uh, uh, interval, and then you would just have observations at the points where you have observations and, and you'd end up potentially with a lot of missing data. Uh, this approach is very general. It works, uh, it's simple, it's easy to implement. Uh, one of the challenges with this approach is that if you end up with a lot of latent variables um, that you can have, um, it can really slow down your MCMC because you have a lot of things, a lot of variables you need to estimate. Uh, and since you're not observing any of them, you actually end up with kind of a strong covariance between these different latent states that are only informed by each other. Um, but it's, it's nice in that it's a, a general solution. It's a very easy to implement solution. Option two uh, is to include time explicitly in your process model. And that requires more of a problem specific solution um, because you need to be able to think through how to handle uh, unequal time steps within your process model itself, while still importantly accounting for how uh, the observation errors and the, and the process error, well, not the observation errors, how the process errors are accumulating over time. So if you just have a constant process error parameter, you know, sigma, you can't just apply that sigma the same for every time point if the time intervals between them are, are not the same. You have to account for the fact that over longer time intervals, um, the observation error is going to accumulate. It's going to be uh, larger. So if we think about the example we used in the last set of lectures where we had this um, exponential growth model where we had uh, x representing the log of a population at time t, and so we have now this log of the population at time delta t in the past, um, when the Sampling interval was constant, that was just, this delta t was just a one. And so we had a growth rate for that time interval and we had a, an, an error over that time interval. Uh, and now, uh, instead of having uh, just a constant one here, we actually have to account for that uh, time step explicitly. So we have this delta t, which may be you know, either greater or less than, than the default time step of one. Uh, so here's an example of this uh, from, from the textbook, uh, looking at the population dynamics of a bird, the black knotty, um, where we're trying to estimate the process error and we're now assigning uh, unique observation errors at each time point, reflecting the different information. So we're, we're using that idea that we have informative priors at each time point to inform the observation error that is unique to each time point, and then we have uh, unequal observa observation levels so that we see kind of large gaps between. We, we're connecting the dots in these confidence intervals. We don't actually, we haven't actually inferred kind of the expected kind of balloon shape uh, interval for the years in between. So we don't actually have an estimate of the population for those intermediate years. Um, what we see, we can recover the population in those years, and we can recover uh, the overall uh, population growth rate um, with those unequal intervals. Uh, we can contrast that example where we modeled the unequal intervals explicitly to an approach where we just treated all these intermediate years as missing data. Um, and we can see there, we kind of do get this kind of, we do get an explicit estimate for the states in between, and we have this kind of balloon-shaped uh, interval estimates. Uh, the actual inferred means uh, do change somewhat, particularly when we see uh, this large gap uh, here in, between 1910 and 1948, where there's only one observation. Uh, when we're treating this as missing data, um, the, the model actually smooths over that more and is more likely to consider this 1928 time uh, uh, point to be a bit of an outlier than it otherwise would. But otherwise, the rest of it looks the same. 
and we can see that we can end up with um, a very similar estimate of the, the latent population growth rate uh, between the two models. So the other thing I want to talk about was, uh, in talking about the state space framework, was this idea that it's very flexible in the structure of the model as long as that model is, is dynamic, that is predicting the, the future state as a function of the current state. So I wanted to extend the exponential example that we've talked about so far to um, a logistic growth model, which is now a, a, a nonlinear model. So before we had, we took our, our um, continuous time model and we can convert it to a discrete time model on a, on a log scale. We can do the same thing with the, this Ricker logistic, discrete time logistic growth model. Um, where we take the log of both sides and now we again have x of t plus one, x of t, and instead of just r, we now have r times one minus n of k. And, and important to note that that n is, is on a linear domain. So that n is just uh, the exponent of x, or likewise x is an exponent of n. So you know if you actually implemented this, you'd have to um, actually exponentiate x to get it back into a linear scale. So these are, are, are not different variables, they're the same latent variable. Uh, but it does then generate a nonlinear relationship uh, over time in a nonlinear dynamic model. A couple other things we'd want to think about when in implementing this model is some of the constraints. Uh, in particular, uh, we have this parameter k in the denominator, which is um, the carrying capacity of the population. And we know that for this model to make sense, that carrying capacity he has to be a positive uh, continuous number, and so we'd want to uh, put a positive continuous prior on that, you know, such as log normal or gamma. We likewise probably, um, well, I guess with R, we, we technically can have a wider range of growth rates, including negative growth rates. We wouldn't necessarily have to assume that R is positive. Uh, and and because this is a nonlinear model, we're going to end up having to do some sort of metropolis hasting sampling. Uh, for k. Uh, that said, you can actually potentially uh, improve the sampling by moving k into the, numer into the numerator and reparameterizing that. Uh, cool. So this figure shows uh, the fitting of the logistic growth model to um, a population time series. In this case, this is moose data that from the Bioluisa Premu evil forest, uh, which is located in Poland. And this time series is, goes back to the 1940s. Uh, here we have up through the, the mid 90s. Um, and we're trying to fit um, logistic growth model. And then the um, top panel here, we're seeing what we would get if we fit the logistic growth model as if it were a function. So we just, you know, treat it as, you know, you plug in parameters, you run that model forward. It predicts a curve, and we're trying to minimize the error between the models and the data and get the best fitting curve. Uh, versus in the lower panel, where we are now fitting that stain model as a process. So now, you know, at every time point, we're estimating the state, latent state of the system in a state space framework. And we're, from that time point, we're trying to predict the next time point and accounting for the process error in doing so, and then also accounting for the observation error between the model and the data. Uh, we can see the state space model uh, handling the gaps in the data. Uh, in this particularly, we have a, a large gap in the 1960s, uh, and then a single year gap uh, in the late 80s. And we can also see, you know, uh, in the bottom right panel, this partitioning between the observation and process error, and particularly the uh, conclusion that that most of the variability that we've seen this time series is likely to be variability in the process itself, uh, not variability in um, our observation. So it's saying that the, the variability that we see here is real, not just a, a reflection of observation error in the um, in, in our ability to count moose. Uh, 